Alex Ariola. Um, he is a research associate um, here at Macquarie University in astrophotonics, and his research interest uh, is in design, fabrication, and characterization of infrared devices that we can be used uh, in astrophotonics, especially uh, in hunt for the Earth-like planets. So tonight, Alex is going to give us a talk about the hunt for planets in other galaxies. There you go, Alex. Thanks everyone for coming, uh, and I hope you enjoy in, in the uh, open night. Uh, first of all, I want to try to keep the uh, the talk kind of low key. So if anybody has any questions, I'm going too fast or things are getting lost, please just stop me, ask a question, and we'll continue from there. We'll all enjoy the the talk much more than than if we get lost. So as the the intro, uh, hi. So as in the introduction, uh, I've been here at Macquarie University for a couple of years now before I was working in Scotland, working on uh, the fabrication of small devices to try to look for planets in, in other galaxies. Um, why is that? Well, we have to go back, to, back in time to uh, 20 years ago when National Geographic posted this, uh, this front cover saying, are we alone? And that's basically the main questions that we've been trying to, or humankind has been trying to answer for the last probably two, three thousand years old at least. So far, we've been quite successful. Um, as of this morning, we've discovered a total of over 3,000 planets, uh, and we're waiting for the confirmation of almost another 5,000 planets. However, that's not the answer that we're trying to answer. Uh, to Oh, that's not the question that we're trying to answer. The, the question that we're trying to answer is, is there life in, in any other planet? And when we mean life, we're not talking about aliens or things like that, or ET coming from another, from another planet. It's more about finding, even if it's uh, microbes, or if there's bacteria, or if there's any sort of life in, in, another, in another galaxy, another planet. So in order to do that, well, this is basically how the, the curve of uh, planet discovery has been looking. So you can see that up to pretty much 2008, 2009, there wasn't much happening. But since we started uh, launching the, the Hubble Space Telescope and, so, and some of the um, all the astronomical instruments have been very successful and some of the um, galaxies, uh, the surveys have been really successful. We can see that in the last two, three, four years, we've been having a lot of uh, confirmed planets. Now, some of you might wonder, how do we know if we're finding a planet, if we're looking at a planet, or, or what is it that we're looking when we're looking at a star? So there's mainly three techniques that we've been looking at uh, to see if we can see, a, uh, if we can find a planet in, in another galaxy, in another uh, solar system, basically. The first one uh, is called transit, and basically what we're looking is how much light we're getting from the, from the actual star. So you can see that if there's a planet, as the planet is going in front of the star, we're getting a kind of a dip. The, the light coming from the, from the actual star decreases, not by a, by a lot, but approximately, depending on the size of the planet, obviously, but it could be around 1% or something like that. So you can think about it, like you're looking at a star, and for a few seconds, a few minutes, or a few hours, depending how far the, the, the planet is from the star and how big the, the trajectory is, the, <coughs> the light coming from that star is decreasing by 1%. So we're not looking at much, much of a change. The second technique is related to what <coughs> uh, Professor Fred Watson was, was speaking about this uh, this evening and it's about gravitation and it's about gravity and it's basically because a planet um, has a force, a gravitational force with respect to the star and vice versa, both of them kind of have a really really slight wobble of each other. So then as they are rotating, the signal that we're getting coming from the star it's, it's got this small change, and that's what, we, what we're trying to, to detect. And the third technique uh, is called imaging, and it's about trying to create an image out of what we're seeing. So basically what we do is we take a star, and we put basically a patch in front of the star, and we try to analyze 
the light that is coming from the from the surrounding of the star and try to analyze and try to see if we can make an image out of what is coming out of the star. Basically, we're trying to avoid as much straight light as possible from the actual uh, star and try to analyze what is coming uh, from around it. Now, this is basically a, a bit of a, a graph that shows what kind of planets we've been uh, able to, to show or to, to discover so far. So we can see this axis represents the, the mass of the planet and this how far it is from the actual star. The Earth is right here and we can see that so far the only planets that we've been able to, to find are really, really big planets that are either, they could be really close to the star but they can also be really far from the star. And depending on the techniques, so for example for the transit, we only be able to, to find really big planets because when you're looking at the, at the actual star, there will be a really big dip, a really big change in the, in the light coming from the star. When you're looking at the Doppler effect, which is basically the, the second one that we were talking about, um, you basically can see a really big change because the planet and the star, they, they kind of uh, um, interact in a, in a really big way. And then when it comes to imaging, which is the in my opinion, is probably the, the, most promising, uh, the most promising technique. We can only see planets that are really, really big and that are really, really far away from, from the star. And the reason for that is <coughs> you need to be able to, when you're looking at the star, you need to be able to see something that is going around it and try to image it far away from it. So if you don't have a really high what is called angular resolution. If you don't have that possibility of distinguishing two objects that are really close together, then you're never gonna be able to, to find a planet around, around the, the main star. Now, the next step that you might think is like, well, all this is really nice, but if the planets are really far away from the star, it basically means that there's no heat coming to the planet. And if we wanna find life, or as at least the way we, we understand life, there needs to be liquid water on the surface of the planet. In order to have liquid water in the surface of the planet, as uh, most of you might know, the, the water needs to be at least between zero and 100 degrees, probably more between 20 and 80 degrees rather than uh, zero to 100. So then the region in the one, those planets needs to be compared to the star and compared to the size of the star, they, they need to be in what is called the habitable zone. And it's this region in here that is obviously going to depend on the size of the star. So if the star is really, really big, then the planet can be further away. And obviously, as I was saying, the, the, this is basically the, the radius of the, of the orbit around it. And we want to be in here. As you can see, if we've got a, a relative mass of a star of one, and this is comparing to the sun, this will be the sun, then the radius of a planet that has water, it will be right here. And if you look at Mars, it's right on the edge of that habitable sun. And that's why in the last probably five years, with all the uh, NASA missions into, into Mars, we've been able to find that there was uh, kind of traces of ice on the surface and what seems to be uh, rivers. And that's probably because the, our sun at the moment is decreasing in temperature. So at some point, there's a chance that there could have been uh, some water on the, on the surface of, of Mars. Now, one of the biggest problems when, uh, when, when we go into, into these techniques is that the more light you want to collect from, from these stars, the bigger the telescope you, you need to get. And the bigger the telescope, then the instruments that you need to use, or so all the optics and all the, um, all the technology that you need to use, increases in size. And there's this, I promise this is the only formula that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna show tonight, just to make it really easy. <coughs> but the only thing that you need to take into account in here is the, the resolution, the how good an instrument is gonna be, it's going to depend on the size of the telescope. And obviously, at the moment, uh, with the telescopes that we've got, um, the, the instruments that we're looking at are basically the size of, probably half the size of this room. And when you think about it, that they need to be, for example, uh, stable in temperature, in humidity, in any kind of conditions, uh, within a, 
fraction of a degree uh, in temperature, then it becomes really, really difficult. And also, obviously, the cost also scale of in a, in a power of two or even a power of three with respect to the, the size of the telescope. Now, the biggest telescopes that we've got at the moment, they are between eight to 10 meters in, in diameter. That's basically the diameter of the primary mirror, so the biggest mirror of the telescope. But at the moment, um, different consortiums in, in the world, they're looking at building bigger telescopes. And when I mean bigger telescopes, I mean like big, big telescopes. This is basically just a, an artist's impression of uh, one of the biggest telescopes that is uh, meant to be built in the, in the next few years. And you can see this is a Boeing 747. The size of these, of these telescopes is just massive. Just to, to let you have a, a bit of a comparison, these are basically the biggest telescopes that we've got at the moment. We've got the Subaru telescope in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. We've got the Gemini. We've got uh, the ones in, in Arizona, the LBT. And the new ones that we're now thinking about building are basically these three of them. Well, this one has been canned. Uh, this one's in, in, in meant to be in Hawaii, but due to um, some, some problems with, uh, with the locals, it's not going to be built anymore. Um, uh, the, the, this is just a reference of how big a tennis court and how big a telescope, uh, sorry, a basketball court is uh, compared to these telescopes. And this is basically the size of these instruments that need to analyze the light um, coming from the stars if we have one of these telescopes. So you can think about how expensive this is going to get really, really quick. Now, as my good friend, not that I know him, but Schumacher would say, any intelligent fool can make things bigger and more complex. But it takes a touch of, of genius and a lot of courage to go in the opposite direction. And this is basically what we're doing here at Macquarie University. What we're basically doing is we're taking uh, a laser and a piece of glass, and we're focusing the laser inside the glass to create uh, what is called an optical circuit. And in this circuit, we can trace the light in three dimensions, and we can make any kind of circuit. Here, this is an example of the kind of thing that we can create here at Macquarie University. And this is basically equivalent to the instrument that I was telling you about before, that it was half of the size of this room. At the moment, it doesn't have as good resolution, but we believe that in the next one to two years, this is going to be as good as any of those instruments. So yeah, basically what we're doing is going in the opposite direction. So we've got, this is the size of the chips that we're getting. It's basically, it fits in, well, it's basically the size of your, of your finger. This is the way we create it, and this is the, the full package device at the end of it. Uh, we've got it there uh, next to a 10 cent coin. Uh, this is basically this chip in here. Then we have a second chip that combines the light so that we can get the information. And that at the outside, we basically have everything packaged into an aluminum uh, piece. And for those not familiar, this is basically what is called a spectrograph. And what it does is it gives you information about what is the composition of a star, what is the composition of um, anything in general, what is the, not of the water, because at the end of the day, it's only going to tell you it's water, but of any other thing. It could be even the atmosphere. So the kind of information you get is something like this. So if we will be looking at the, uh, at the Earth, we'll be looking that we've got some absorption, what is called an absorption line, so some of these black lines of ozone, ozone, oxygen, water, we've got methane, uh, CO2, we've got all those absorption lines. So by comparing it to, to different, um, different models that we've got, we can <laughs> determine what is, the, what is the composition of different stars. Yes? What's CO2? CO2 is carbon dioxide. So when you breathe in, you inhaling uh, oxygen, and when you breathe out, you exhaling uh, CO2, carbon dioxide. And we've shown that this, is, uh, that this technique, this is spectroscopy, uh, is possible. This is basically a comparison between um, the, the theoretical spectrum that you would obtain from this star with this strange name, which is not even relevant at the moment, and this is the results that we obtain with, with our miniaturized spectrograph that, that I was showing you in here. And you can see that you can get all the absorption lines that we were talking about, 
and basically obtain a, any information that you, you could be looking at. Now, this is very interesting, but I'm talking about a spectroscopy and nobody came here to, to listen about a spectroscopy. We're here to listen about imaging and we're listening about how to find new planets. And this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about. How difficult is to image a planet uh, from the Earth? Okay, just to let you have an idea, it's like imaging a firefly that is one millimeter far from the light bulb of a lighthouse while you're 20 kilometers in the sea, in rough sea, <laughs> and when the light bulb doesn't look like a, just like a nice light bulb, but the light that you're getting looks something like that because of the atmosphere this distortion. So you can imagine that it's not easy. If it would be easy, we would know many, many other Earth-like planets or planets that could have water or anything in them. So what do we do then? What we do is we use a technique called interferometry. And it's based basically on having you get two sources of information. In this case, you take two exact copies of the light coming from the star. And by doing some specific combination, basically you delay one of the, one of the uh, channels with respect to the other and you combine them. And by combining them, you're able to null, that's why it's called null interferometry. So you got able to cancel part of the light, which is the light that is coming from the, from the star. And all the signal that you've got in your detector is basically signal coming from the planet. So basically means that by using just, in this case, two points, you're able to see that any information you're getting in your detector is actual planetarium uh, light. Now, what are the benefits of this? Well, with this technique, uh, we're canceling all the information coming from the star. We get a really high contrast. Basically because, as I was saying, any light that is not coming from, from the planet gets cancelled. So at the end of the day, we get a really high contrast. And the second thing we get is we get a really high angular resolution. And this is what we were talking about, being able to distinguish things that are really, really close to, to the actual star, to the actual sun in other planetary system. This is basically just a simulation of the kind of um, information or the kind of um, graph that you will be getting when you're imaging a planet. So these are basically depending on the baseline, which is basically the distance between the two, the two, de um, the two telescopes or the two uh, sources to, to detect the, the information. And this is basically the kind of information that you will be getting. Now, interferometry is really, really good and it could be used for, uh, for uh, exoplanet hunting, but it can also be used for other things that many people, especially the, the military forces won't tell you about and is to look at uh, satellites or looked at spy satellites. So this is just a really old, this is probably like a 20 year old image of a satellite taken from the Earth. Uh, nowadays, they can basically tell you how many screws a satellite has uh, in looking from the Earth. So you can see what are the military applications of these things when, you, when you're thinking about it for a little bit. Now, as I was saying, we're gonna do photonic interferometry so the way we do it is we take the light from the star with the telescope we've got a bunch of optics that reroute the light so basically get it into the right into the right shape and into the right size and we inject it into one of these uh, chips that I was telling you about and then we can analyze the light now something I didn't tell you but I think is really really important is when we're talking about this and we're talking about a telescope that in diameter is basically eight meters or 10 meters in diameter. What I didn't tell you is that these little light paths, the size of them is around 10 microns, which is basically a 10th of a human hair. So you take a, a human hair and in width, you divide it in 10 and that's basically the size of it. Now, think about it. All the optics and all the engineering that you need to do to put the light coming from a star into these little channels to get the information out. How do we do that? Okay, so basically this is how uh, a pupil image of the telescope looks like. So basically this would be your primary mirror and then you would have the, the light comes into the primary mirror, then it gets reflected into the secondary mirror, which is this one in here. These are called the spiders. So you basically have a really big plate 
where the light gets uh, collected and then it gets reflected into the secondary mirror and then from the secondary mirror gets collected into <coughs> whatever the optical table or whatever the, the instrument that, that you want to use. In our case, we're going to take two points of the, of the telescope pupil, two, two points of your, of your primary mirror and those are the two points that we're going to, that we're going to combine. We've got our, our optical design that, that I was telling you about, and here is where we're gonna be combining our, our light. And using the technique that I was telling you about, we're gonna combine them. This is basically how the null interferometer chip looks like. It's basically the size, probably the size of, of my phone or something like that. We, we do all the packaging. This is basically the, the lenses to to, copy, to, to put the light in. And this is basically a really interesting part of the, of the whole device. It's a, it's a MEMS. It's basically a bunch of uh, micro mirrors that you can control in, the th in two directions, tip and tilt, and then you can also change the, the distance so that you can have a really high accuracy to, to launch into, your, into these light pipes, into these photonic circuits. As I was saying before, each one of these lines is basically one-tenth of a human hair. Now, the next thing you need to do is you need to use all these optics that I was uh, telling you guys about and put them into, into a breadboard. But in our case, it's only 300 millimeters by 600 millimeters, which is basically the size of three A4 sheets put together. So you, you can see that compared to, to the other spectrographs that we were talking about before that were the size of, or half the size of this, of this room, this is really, really small. This is basically where our MEM sits. And this is where our chip is sitting. And this is basically the, the, the path that the light does when, when it goes into our instrument. This is just a bunch of, uh, you can see that all the beam paths are completely folded so that it fits into a really, really small. Uh, we got awarded time in, to, in one of the biggest and, and best telescopes in, in the world, which is in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And these are two of the, our team members. You can see our instrument, which by the way is not even sitting flat, is sitting on the side, which makes it a bit more complicated. And they spent a couple of weeks up there uh, looking, at, looking at the light uh, collected with, this, with these telescopes. These are some of the results. I'm not going to go into the details because there's not much time, but if anybody's interested, we can have a chat afterwards. These are some of the results that we were obtaining in the lab, and these are basically the kind of peaks that you would be obtaining when looking at, at planets. Now, we did have a, a, bit of a, a bit of an issue with the Subaru telescope, even though it's one of the best telescopes in the world. The signal that we got, not in the lab, but in the telescope, it looks a little bit like that, so not the, not the way we, we would have expected, but there's, there's a reason behind. The reason is this, uh, mechanically at the moment because of the cold and, and some issues that they've been having in the past, um, the super telescopes has some vibrational issues. So as soon as it starts tracking the star and you're trying to look for the, for the planets around it, it starts having a little bit of a wobble and that's what is creating all these uh, lines in here, which is basically this six hertz in frequency um, signal. Basically, uh, it's trying to to track, but it's vibrating, and that's what is what is giving you this this weird signal. Now, is this a bad thing? Well, obviously, it is bad because we haven't been able to do any science. We haven't been able to discover any planet. But at the same time, this is a really really good thing because our instrument is so sensitive that in the previous 10 years, nobody has been able to detect this. They were doing science and they were discovering things, but at the same time, they didn't even see this. So we're so sensitive, we're gonna be able to see so many things as soon as they fix the telescope, that I believe this is just gonna be like one of Australia's best things in the next 10 years. Oh, seriously. Now, let's just go to the conclusions. I hope at least out of this talk you, you get out of the door and you know a little bit more about planet hunting and the techniques that we use. If you remember a little bit more, you will remember that this is a really exciting time for humankind in terms of looking for exoplanets and looking for, for life potentially in other, in other planets, maybe even water if there's life. Um, and also that Macquarie University at the moment is leading the world building these small compact solutions uh, for planet hunting. 
Um, before I finish, uh, I would like to, this is not my work only, I'm only part of a, of a bigger team, and this is people involved. We've got people from Macquarie University, the University of Sydney, the Australian uh, Astronomical Observatory, and the Subaru Telescope. Well, it would be uh, around 10,000 times the, the size of the Earth, approximately. Well, the Kepler actually just got uh, some new results of, as of last week. Uh, the, the Kepler mission, I think it was launched 10 years ago, something like that. And they basically, they've been basically collecting all the data and making sure that all the data was correct before launching anything because this was a really major discovery. 